Hello, and thank you for joining the presentation today, where we'll talk about small angle X-ray scattering approaches for pharmaceutical studies. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in. I'm here with my colleague, Aya Takasi, and she'll be fielding those questions as we go through, and we'll wrap up at the end and, and go through them together. So again, thanks for coming today. So given the large number of possible candidates of uh, pharmaceuticals, so you really need a technique that's suitable to study many material phases, as well as the interactions of candidate drug mixtures. So SACS is such a technique that's good for that and uh, because it can provide accurate structural information and it usually only requires a minimum of sample preparation. So not only does this work for pharmaceutical samples, but for very broad applications like biological materials, polymers, colloids, chemicals. But today we're going to talk about pharmaceutically relevant uh, samples. So let's, let's get started. So today what we're going to cover is what types of information we can get from small angle x-ray scattering. Um, if you saw the talk earlier in the day, she mentioned a little bit about uh, neutron scattering. We'll focus on x-rays. We'll talk about how X uh, SACS works. Um, we'll talk about solutions, dilute versus high concentration solutions and how they apply to pharma. And we'll talk about uh, some ordered pharmaceutical samples. So what can we learn from this technique? Well, uh, SACS most specifically tells us about size. So if we wanted to know the size of this particle, or basically the D here, then we could easily measure for a solution of these particles and determine the size. And if it turns out that there's a dispersed mixture, meaning that they're different sizes, then we can get a measure of that as well. In addition to size information, SACS provides uh, information about the shape of the particle as well as its morphology. So what, is, what does that mean? Well, it means we can tell a hollow cylinder from a filled cylinder. Um, we can tell a hollow sphere from a filled sphere, or we can tell a sphere whose shell material is different from its core material. So we can analyze things of that nature. And additionally, SACS provides us information about particle interactions and particle packing. So for example, we can look at aggregation or amorphous uh, solutions, um, or we can look at ordered packing. Um, and in that sense, SACS gives, can give us dimensions of packing in the same way that X-ray diffraction does. However, in this case, we're looking at many particles coming together and looking at spacing there rather than atomic spacing. So what does a typical SACS experiment look like? Well, it looks like this. So SACS instruments, of course, have an X-ray source, a downstream sample holder. Downstream of that, we have a detector and a beam stop, and the beam stop may be monitoring the beam intensity throughout. And this is often carried out in a vacuum. So during the sample experiment, X-rays are mostly transmitted in a, are mostly uh, ex exposing the sample in a transmission mode. And then we see scattering like the example uh, image you see to the right. And in this case, uh, for this example, you'll see on the bottom the relevant scattering angle. So if you're, you've are you done XRD before, you probably talk in 2 theta. For X-ray uh, scattering, we talk in Q, um, which that expresses the scattering anger, angle in a wavelength dependent manner. So here's an example, SACS image. Um, and not all scattering experiments are exactly like that. Um, so, for example, the samples can scatter isotropically. What does that mean? It means that if we look at the scattering vector in this direction, it produces the exact same profile of one produced from this direction. Scattering can also be anisotropic. Uh, in that case, the scattering vector in this direction will produce a different scattering intensity profile from this direction. So that might mean that you uh, integrate or you process data differently depending on how you're sample scatters. So for example, here we can integrate across all angles. And in this case, we might instead just integrate across a wedge. And from that, we're going to get a 2D profile. So let's go back to our original scattering image. 
And, uh, and here it is on the left. And if we integrate that across all angles, we get a scattering profile that provides the intensity versus Q. And generally, we look at the log of intensity versus Q or a log log plot. So where does this intensity come from? So I don't plan on going over much mathematics in any detail today, but I do want to share a few equations. So this is the standard equation for SACS that describes how intensity is impacted by various factors of the sample. And so here we see that uh, the intensity of the SACS experiment is directly proportional to several factors, including uh, the square of rho, which is the electron density difference and the volume and a couple of other factors. So let's look at the contribution of these before we move on to talk about these other contribu contributors. So as shown in this equation, uh, the Sachs intensity scales with the squared volume of the particle. That means the larger the particle gets and also the, the more electrons there are, it's going to scatter much more intensely. So if you think about it, a particle that's, say, 10 nanometers will contribute one one hundredth of the intensity of, say, something compared to a 100 nanometer particle. So what that means is if we have mixtures of very large particles and small particles, then the signal from the small particles, uh, larger particles, may significantly tr contribute, and we may not even see the scattering contribution from smaller particles. So for that reason, when you're... Uh, you're preparing your sample, you might want to think about dispersity of this type and making sure that you're actually looking at what you want to look at. Um, so, for example, do you need to prepare a more monodispersed sample? Um, that's something to consider. Additionally, we also see that the scattering intensity is directly proportional to the square of the electron density difference. And that tells us if there's no density between our particle and the matrix it's embedded in, we will not see any scattering. Uh, it also means that because we're only looking at differences, a matrix with holes looks the same thing as a bunch of particles in a similarly sized matrix. So then the pictures shown below on the right, you see uh, a sample that has good electron density contrast, whereas on the left, you, you don't have such good density contrast. And there are experiments where you can manipulate this and your uh, bulk material to enhance this, but know that your intensity improves as your contrast improves. So how about those other couple of terms? So the remaining uh, terms in this equation refer to the form factor, f of q, and the structure factor S of Q. And that's uh, sometimes referred to as the solution structure factor. So the form factor is the portion of the equation where the particle and size, the particle size and the particle shape make the biggest contributions to the uh, measured intensity. And the structure factor portion of the equation is affected completely by the packing of the particles. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail. So here we have x-ray scattering where we've divided the form factor plot and a structure factor plot. And in this case, uh, the form factor comes, gains its shape and intensity profile directly from the shape and size of the particle. If in fact, none of the particles are interacting, then the solution structure factor will be one for all scattering angles. And if you take the product of these two, like you saw in the previous equation, what you end up is something that gives you information about size and shape alone. Uh, so what is a structure factor look like? Well, here's a couple of examples. Um, and these particles that are interacting either in an attractive way or repulsive way will have non-zero structure factors um, through with its scattering angle. And they're sometimes called non-ideal because they're not monodispersed and there are interactions. So as it turns out, you can see easily aggregation and repulsion. So in this case, aggregate, aggregated forces, the form factor is still gonna look the same because we're still looking at the particles. Um, and then the structure factor is gonna be greater than one at very small scattering angles and then oscillate around one with increasing angle. When you take the product of that, then you get something like this. So you get the sharp uptick at low angle. 
What about repulsive forces? Well, form factor is the same in this case. They're all the same particles we're looking at. And in this case, at very low scattering angles, the uh, structure factor value is quite low, comes back to one and has a much narrow oscillation, narrower oscillation around one, and it looks something like this. So if you were expecting a monodispersed ideal sample and you see a sharp uptick or a quick dive at low angle, you know you do not have a sample that's just expressing the form factor. You've got some other stuff. But there are some good things you can do um, if you do have just the form factor and a structure factor equal to one. And in those cases, most often you're working in dilute aqueous conditions. And again, I told you, got to be monodispersed. So we've got to get rid of any polydispersity, whether those be in monomer dimer mixtures or completely different contaminant mo molecules. Um, we've got to get rid of repulsive interactions. Are your buff buffer conditions correct, for example, so that we have this nice mixture? And if you have that, what you can do, knowing that you have measured the form factor, you can look at a variety of different plots to extract some information. And I'm just quickly going to go through these and give you an example because this is quite often used for biologics, and we'll see an example in a minute. So the first thing you can do is you can plot just the very low angle uh, points and look at what's called a Guinier plot. And this looks like uh, the form of a mathematical equation, y equals mx plus b. So it means that our we can determine the zero intercept or zero scattering angle. That's going to tell us about uh, the um, molecular weight of our sample or how many electrons it has for our particle. And the slope of this line is going to tell us the size. And what it can also be used as is a diagnostic. So in this case, this is a, a Guignet plot example for uh, bovine serum albumin, in which case it's either aggregated, meaning it has a, a sharp uptick, it's well behaved, or it um, has inner particle repulsion. So you'll often hear people talk about frowns and smiles in Guignet plots, and that's what they're referring to. So the other thing we can look at is the extended structure ask, is this a com collapsed particle or is it extended like polymer-like? And we can do that by plotting all of the data in a cracky plot. This is Q squared I versus Q. And it gives you an idea if you have a collapse, collapsed or say folded particle or whether you have something that's extended. And uh, in this case, we do have a number of different protein systems that are, are highly extended when they don't have their binding partners. And so that's a, a wide field of study and relevant for pharmaceuticals. So these are just a few examples of lysozyme that's properly folded, that's in some urea or has been heated or is quite unfolded by addition of both. So you can derive that if you know that you have a mono dispersed ideal sample. Um, additionally, what you can do is a pair distance distribution function. And basically what that does is it gets you from reciprocal space to a uh, real space. Um, so you can start to derive some models. All right, so we're gonna quickly look at that for glucose isomerase. So here's a mixture of those, several scattering profiles. They perfectly overlay with a Guignet plot, a Kratky plot that shows it's folded. And we've done an inverse uh, direct indirect Fourier transform, and we can then calculate a model. So I've gone quickly through this, but it gives you an idea what you can do if you're working in that type of sample space. More often than not, though, if you're working in pharmaceuticals, you want a high concentration, um, and you want to make sure that it's stable at high concentrations so that it can be injected or something of that nature. So for a high concentration example, we have monoclonal antibodies, and we have a number of those. We're collecting at a, a concentration range from one to 100. And these are the data for the two antibodies. If we look really closely at the small angle, we see some of these effects that we talked about for the nine ideal case. And it turns out that this is um, a hallmark of inner particle repulsion. So uh, what we can do is we're not completely lost, but uh, we do know that if we continue to dilute and we see a stable uh, scattering profile, then we have the form factor and we can further examine the structure factors for uh, these different uh, samples.
So um, another thing that we can do is we can look at known order delivery systems. So there are some cases where crystalline suspensions are the goal, and this is a good technique for looking at that. So we received a number of samples from a customer, and it was quite easy to see the difference between something that's crystalline and not. And just to show you one example, this is a human growth hormone, and several of these are crystallized, and of course one isn't. So that's really a kind of a qualitative uh, example in this case. So how about a different type of ordered structure? Well, we'll wrap up by looking at an example of monoolein. So monoolein is a glycerol monooleate. hope I said that right. So it's amphiphilic um, and it's widely used as an emulsifier, moisturizer, or, or thickener in foods and cosmetics and pharmaceuticals. So it has a hydrocarbon chain that's attached to a glycerol background. And, uh, and it's one of the most um, studied skin penetrating enhancers of, of, this, of this type. So, and it's very um, popular because it's non-toxic, it's biodegradable. And even better, it's been very well characterized. So what we decided to do is to undertake a, an experiment with um, monoalane water mixtures where we would ramp the temperature to show the different phases to see if we can see those and then we can go on to do different mixtures. It's very common um, that uh, in some in the literature that's been done. So here I'll show you the example results for that. So it's just a quick movie and we're ramping from minus 10 degrees up to 90 degrees and we can start to see the phase changes. And if we wanna understand the phase changes, then we can refer to uh, the relative peak positions that we see in our plots and determine whether we have a laminar fa lamellar phase, hexagonal or perhaps a cubic phase. Um, there are actually a couple of other phases that we see, but only when we add other things like salts or um, other detergents. So you see, we can clearly explore this space uh, and then we can make a different mixture and look at that as well. All right, so uh, just real quickly, I just wanna review um, what we covered today. So. We looked at some of the information we can get from SACS. Uh, we looked at how SACS worked and we looked at dilute versus high concentration samples and how you can do some structural modeling if you have um, mono dispersed ideal samples, how you can extract some high concentration structural interaction information and we can look at some ordered uh, pharmaceutical examples. And with that, I'd just like to, anal uh, I'd like to acknowledge Mark Del Campo uh, Damien Hood, William Whithold for uh, providing samples, feedback, and measurements, and Aya Takase for today. And I'd like to thank you for joining.